All right. Hello, everybody. I'm going to talk about um, the production project. So I work for Microsoft. I'm not in Microsoft Research. I work on a product team. I work on a Bing search engine. And everything I want to talk to you right now is real stuff. This is joint work with Kathy Marshall and Mark Nyork. So we're going to be talking about product, uh, crowdsourcing in production. Um, we're interested in large scale data sets, not small things, large scale, millions of labels. We want to execute tasks continuously. Assessing the relevance of the search engine is an ongoing thing that you do on a daily basis. And the third item is crowdsourcing tasks are very difficult to divide. Okay, that's a problem. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me now? How about now? Yes. Okay, so we have also a number of caveats. Um, assessing um, social media, say a tweet or a Facebook post, is even more difficult because it's very subjective. Now we have a number of uh, potential contingent factors in crowdsourcing. The workers may be spammers. Your task sucks, basically, and the data is awful, okay? Also, very low interrated agreement, and you don't have a goal set. Okay, so what we want to get at the end of the day is, is there a way that we can have a framework to make sure that uh, there's at least some sort of reliability on your crowdsourcing task? This is the goal of the paper. So the two research questions, for the academics, can we develop an effective way of debugging a crowdsourced living task? And the second is, can we bear in mind that the workers are performing a living task in good faith? But before that, I'm going to tell you a story. So a few years ago, we started working with Twitter data, and we wanted to build a classifier, okay, a very simple classifier. So of all the tweets, we're going to classify uh, if a tweet is interesting or not. Simple, right? And uh, this is standard machine learning textbook. Get the labels, perform feature engineering, pick your favorite tool, wake up, whatever, do some modeling, drop the classifier in production, you're done. Well, our kappa values were not that good. I mean, moderate, not that good. And we have a lot of experience doing crowdsourcing, so we thought there's something going on here. There's something else. So. This is a detour on the project, on the classification project. It's a detour on how to label data. And um, sorry to be uh, a bit uh, overemphasizing this, but this is so important. The life cycle of a label. And this is so important. It's so misunderstood. You can see that from my accent, I'm from Argentina. I'm a soccer fan. So I have a lot of judge characteristics if I have to judge a document. Okay? I'm going to judge and I'm going to produce a judgment. Now, Michael is going to produce another judgment, or maybe the same document with the same query. We're going to aggregate those judgments. I'm going to produce a label. Those labels are going to be part of a training set. And because you cannot label the entire web, you use machine learning to label the rest. So you separate the training set in half, one for learning the model to label, the rest for testing that your prediction works, that works, good, okay? So the first part is how to use a crowd to label the data set, and the second part is using machine learning to complete the process of labeling that data set. For this paper, we're going to concentrate on the first half. Um, once again, let me emphasize why. Because as you can see, if you got the wrong labels, you're doomed. Okay. This is the hard part. This is the boring part. Nobody wants to work on this. People want to work on, I love neural networks. And I'm going to use support vector machines. No one wants to go through cleaning, dooping, dealing with people. Okay. This is labeling. All right. Enough of that. Now, to make things even worse, you have a spectrum of different labeling tasks. On one hand, you have 
something very objective, right? So we have a, a question that has a very correct answer. Does the website www.aa.com is the best website for American Airlines? Yes, okay. And A, which is assign some basic aggregations. We have a goal set, and for the first one, we know this is good, and who passed, who didn't pass, right? However, you have a lot of, a lot of tasks who are not so objective, and they're partially objective. So let's take a look at your traditional information retrieval task. Given the query in Knoxville, here's a page. Is this relevant to the topic Knoxville? Well, I don't live here, so maybe I'm not a good judge, but it looks good, and someone will say this is great. And we can, you know, get some integrated agreement between the workers, and overall, we compute uh, some sort of label with consensus, and we're good. But then you're going to get something that is more subjective. Is this tweet interesting? <laughs> well, don't know. And now we're going to start using maybe some polling techniques because we want this. We want to make sure that every time we run the task, we have more or less the same proportions. Okay? So our approach um, is the following uh, figure, which I'm going to explain. Um, the key here is rapid interaction. Okay? Sorry, iteration. We want to be very agile. So we're going to use very small data sets, say 100, 200 tweets. I want to play with all these variations, and then we're going to go forward or go, up, go backward. And the idea is to emphasize testing across the board before you scale. Remember, I want to label millions of tweets. I cannot go with one experiment, pay for millions of tweets, and then say, oh, that's not good. Okay, so this is going to be like very, very small. The first one is we're going to establish a base signal. Then we're going to play with the data. Okay, so the first thing is maybe the data is not good. So we're going to play with the data. Assuming we do that, checking, we're going to play with the workers. Maybe they're spammers. Maybe they're not that good. Maybe they're not experts. I don't know. And the third one is we're going to play with the task design. Maybe the design is not um, the paper has a lot of tables and a lot of graphs, so I'm not going to go through that, but I'm going to say that we use 16 different data sets, two for uh, the baseline. The, we have access to the Twitter file host that work for Microsoft, so we got access to all the data. And we use five workers per tweet assessment, so every tweet was assessed by five people. Um, the, the tables in the paper has lots of details of all the different numbers and uh, dates and so forth. And for um, Platform, we use uh, Mechanical Turn, which is well known, and uh, we have our own uh, platform called UHRS. And I want to make a, a couple of notes on why it's important to measure agreement. Because if we don't agree on something, then maybe the judgment and therefore the label is not fit, is not good. So it cannot be used yet for learning. And how we measure agreement, so we go to the, the literature and they say you, can, you have to use some sort of integrated statistics, and there's a bunch of them. And we settled for Krippendorf, which is uh, one of the main stats. And the reason why we pick Krippendorf is because it works with holes in the metrics. Okay? So if you have a missing value, the, the stat still works. However, um, besides you know, Coinscap and Flash and whatever, all of these statistics were designed with some sort of domain in mind. Education, medicine, content analysis, no information retrieval, no social media. And interpretation is always a problem. There's no consensus on how to interpret the k values or the alpha values. Okay? Each statistician will give it its own interpretation. Uh, the stat will produce a number between minus one and one. Uh, you have to look all like not closer to one. Forget about that. But you're going to go probably between moderate and substantial agreement in the, the context of information retrieval. All right, our baseline. So we start with something very, very basic. By the way, our, my tweets, our tweets are debranded. So there's no account, there's no followers, there's no followers, there's no image. It's just 140 characters. Okay, Paul Allen offers up to a million dollars for artificial intelligence researchers to uncover world-changing breakthroughs. Here's the link. Do you think the tweet is interesting to a broad audience? Yes or no? That's our classifier. Come on, how difficult this could be? It's actually damn difficult. If I take the percentage of interesting as 
uh, consensus, 16%. With older tweets, 14% with new tweets. If I measure alpha, it's awful. Look at those, 0 0.13. Okay, we're like, you know, on poor land. Sorry, on a slide, they're going to be very, very poor. If you go to Gryffindor's book, it's like, are you not? Just discard this. This is completely useless. Okay, that's our baseline. The first knob is we're going to change the data set. Um, the first one was using random tweets. The second is, come on, we're going to use New York Times, LA Times, BBC, Reuters, top 10 news accounts. Hey, they tweet good stuff, not like me, okay? So 10, 10 top uh, news accounts. We're gonna change that, we call the genre. Okay, a little move in the knobs. Okay, slightly better in the uh, percentage of interesting when I, I put news, uh, new content is expected, right? A bomb, an airplane crash is expected. A little bit more, but Krippendorf doesn't move that much. Um, the same with recency. If I put a lot of new content, there's some sort of a bump, but not a lot. Still, no change if I use general, a little bit of recency. Okay, um, so maybe my workers are not doing their job, maybe we don't pay them enough, or maybe they are spammers. So we're gonna um, play with these guys. And if you look at the literature on crowdsourcing, every time there's a quality problem, it's anonymous. These guys are bad. These guys are bad, and we don't believe they're bad. So we're going to do something different. So we borrow an idea from reCAPTCHA. Um, we're going to use the control term. So when you, you have the, you know, you have to open this email account, and you know there's a, a captcha, a reCAPTCHA. You have the control term and the other term, and you have to guess them both right. And one of them is already uh, in part of the task. And we call them hidden, human intelligence, data-driven inquiries. And the point is we're going to compute these things before we upload the data. There are two questions as, as control. One is an algorithmic question. We call it algorithmic because you can compute the answer by, you know, algorithmically. You have a, a semantic question. Don't worry, I'll show examples. And uh, of course, you have to adapt the, this hidden for your learning task. Okay, so this is the task template with a hidden. So you can read that, but it's the same tweet. And the first question is, how many hashtag words, words that begin with hash, are in this tweet? Zero, one, two, three or more. Okay, you have to answer, guess what? Zero, okay? If you didn't answer zero, you're a candidate for like just removing you from the data set. However, if you're, if we're doing like a thousand, maybe you just miss one, okay, maybe you are gonna just be patient unless you know, you're like less than 90%, but you have to really answer this question. Also, you can compute this before you upload the data. Okay, so part of my data processing is I compute how many hashtags are in the, the tweet, and I already know that for this particular tweet, this is the answer, easy. The second is more semantic. The second is, does the tweet name a specific person? In this case, you have to know that, well, Paul Allen is a person. So you can see the pattern. I have to read the first tweet to answer the question one. I have to read again the tweet to answer question two. And then our punch question. Hey, do you think a Twitter is interesting to a broad audience? A second uh, comment on question number two. This is for the uh, machine learning people in the audience, which you know, you're gonna be using a lot of features. Question two is for the same uh, amount of work, for the same money, you are evaluating a potential feature. In this case, say for example that you want to use a name entity extractor as a feature. So you want to make sure that the tagger is actually tagging right this. So we're going to exercise at the same time, not only I get, I'm getting my label, but at the same time I'm just evaluating one of the features. All right, and we're going to look at the numbers. Um, the alpha for question one is pretty damn good. For question two is very good. So like the old quote from the movie, smell that, smell that, smell of victory, right? <laughs> no, which is basically what, what, what's going on. So question one is good, these are not spammers. Question two is 
slightly less because we know it's a bit semantic. People are going to miss a few things, but still good. So we have a problem, and the problem is somewhere else. The problem is on the question. The problem is the main thing that we want to get is not coming through. Okay? So we're going to redesign the task. Same tweet debranded, same question one, same question two. But for question three, instead of saying, is this tweet interesting to a broader audience? Yes, no, binary. Why binary? Because I want to build, guess what? A binary classifier. Maybe that label scale is not working for people. So I'm going to use something else. I'm going to use a greater scale. And I'm going to switch back and forth. But this is like yes, no binary. This is, do you think the tweet is worthless? Or trivial? Or funny? Makes me curious. Contains useful information and important news. And also want to make another comment. We can call these labels for the machine. Yes, no. And these are labels for humans. OK, let's look at the numbers. 9, 75. The numbers look slightly better. And we're not claiming victory yet. But we can say that there's signal in detecting what is worthless. And there's signal in detecting what is important. With this in mind, you can say, well, maybe what we need to do is, and excuse my language, we need to build a crab detector, which is much better to detect interesting content. Or maybe you can say, hey, it's much easier to detect important news. But the point here is, you debug until you see if there's something coming up as a part of the signal. And that's what we want. The point of labels for the machine versus label for the humans is we want to, you want to use labels where the humans are comfortable working with and they're good at giving you the best they can. Of course you can take these six grades and just map to your binary classifier and like that. But that's a whole different paper, a whole different project. What we're trying to do here is making sure that everything that I'm trying to get from people is actually working. It's working, it's working fine and I can get what I want. Okay, so far, you know, we uh, made a number of changes on the task. I changed, you know, three elements, the data, the workers, and the task design. So I'll show you three task templates. By the way, we use more than three, way more. I'm only sharing with you three. And the hiddens are going to, uh, basically are going to slow down the workers. So you have to pay a price here because they're all speed bumps. And this table shows you that for different data sets, if I don't use any hidden, people will take an average between you know, two and three seconds to assess my task. But once I put hidden, this even triples the, s the speed. Now, people say, well, but, sorry, your typical ML engineer will say, hmm, it's going to take twice the, the time to get the labels for my modeling. That's not good. On the other hand, you might say, well, it's going to take twice the time. It's going to be very good label quality. Um, and also because what you want is, you want people to read this three times. So then when you go to your question, you know, they read it so, you know, twice, they're going to give you the best level possible. Um, sorry if I speed up. Um, the, the other point why <coughs> labels and, and quality labels is very important for uh, social data is because the way I personally see <coughs> subjective assessment is key for social data. So we move away from just a document from track or a web page a la Google or a la Bing. Okay? Now we're talking about a tweet, a Facebook post, a Quora question, a Foursquare check-in, Snapchat, an image from Instagram, a hashtag, a hashtag. All those things are growing extremely rapidly. Every day there's something new. And if you're in the business of building machine learning solutions, labeling social media data is going to get harder and harder and harder. It's not going to get easier. We, pro we provide what we call a data workers design process. Okay, it's kind of a pattern. 
uh, this should be no surprise because once you involve humans in the loop, you have to look at what they do with the tools they have and the data they have. But zooming into each of these things and sequentially probe them that are actually doing what you want, what at least you think you have to do, is important. Every uh, item on this debugging process um, has to be tested, and you want to use very small data sets. You cannot use very large data sets because it's not going to be agile. What you want is 200, 100, 300 tweets that you can do maybe in an hour, at most two hours. So you can run all these different variations within a day or two days to see which part is actually seems to be working, which is not working. Now the hiddens, which is the uh, our proposal, uh, it's a technique which is going to incorporate our work independent judgment, uh, contributes to the main question. As I said before, for a semantic question, you can get even something more for the price of the same label. So if you're paying, say, for example, five cents. Not only I pay five cents to get my label, I pay five cents to get my label and to check the quality of the target, for example, or whatever else you can use as a hidden. Um, it's not just an attention check. There's a lot of tasks in crowdsourcing that just have an attention check, being like, are you awake? Are you doing this correctly? This is like contributes and it's part of the task. That's the beauty. And overall, produce good results. And as I said before, this is used in production. At least in my team, we use hidden in production for getting thousands of thousands of labels. Um, there's a bit of an art to build the hidden, but once you get good at hidden, then it's pretty neat. Um, as a conclusion of future work, uh, we propose um, an effective debugging process, uh, tested in production, in a wide range of tasks, I'm only showing tweets, but you know, I use it for a lot of other, other stuff at Microsoft. Uh, we propose this technical hidden. Um, something that we want to uh, look in the future is uh, an incentive structure. So far, we've just paid the same, but maybe we pay more or we pay less. Maybe if we are very good, we give you less hidden. Maybe if we don't know you, we give you more hidden. Uh, we have to. We want to explore that. Also, we want to produce um, some sort of a library of hidden. So when you're combined, you're, you're building your task. We're going to suggest you which kind of hidden you want to use for your task. Um, we want to continue working on uh, more on label reliability, in particular in social media. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for your attention.